Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you'll be very glad to know that I'm not standing in John's place to talk this afternoon. Um, there's a cliche that I usually try and avoid when I'm introducing someone, which is that they need no introduction, but I don't know how to avoid it this afternoon <laughs> because I suspect you're a very partisan audience. In fact, I know you're a very partisan audience, and most of you know John incredibly well. Um, so really all I want to say is that we're absolutely thrilled that the day after his 90th birthday, he's here to share some of his extraordinary reminiscences of the last 65 years, minus two, of the Albra Festival. Um, places like Albra, festivals like the Albra Festival, over long periods of time, um, involve and, and attract a, a, a few number of people who, in the end, become legends, part of the myth, part of the history of a particular place or a particular festival. And um, it's not an exaggeration to say that John is, is absolutely one of those figures. So we're very, very lucky to have him here today to share some of his reminiscences about the Albra Festival. Thank you, John. Those of you who are as old as I am may have the same fir re first recollection of the name of Benjamin Britten and the first picture of him uh, happened together in the Radio Times, possibly 1938. Were you there here then? <laughs> um, it was on the occasion when he was going to play his piano concerto at the proms, uh, and uh, there were pictures of him in the mill. Do you all know, have you all seen the mill? Yes. Um, it, it's unfortunately in private hands at the moment, and pity one can't go and have a good look at it. Uh, it's a lovely little thing, uh, and that's, of course, where he wrote Peter Grimes. But uh, that was in, in the future then. Uh, a boy was born was he, one of his first major successes. I'm going to play music today, uh, possibly lesser known uh, Britain. Uh, those of you who are Brit Britannophiles will, will know them, of course, but some of you may not know some of, some of the pieces. Uh, and A Boy Was Born with his choral variations. Up to that time, Ben had written rather, um, rather tricky music, as if he was a tightrope uh, artist, um, dazzling, clever, daring, uh, but not always ter terribly substantial. So it was a wonderful relief when people heard that music of a boy was born. I must say, I didn't hear it for many years after that. But it's a, choral, a set of choral variations lasting 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and it's much more conventional than the, the tightrope music. And here is the actual theme on which he bases it, which gives you an idea of what, it, what the music was like. A boy was born.
A boy was born, a genius was born, had we but realized it at the time. But now we can, when well, now we did. Um, the picture was of a rather scruffy looking boy sitting at the mill and his bicycle beside him. Um, nice homely picture. But now Beth uh, Britton is going to talk to us from the grave, um, alas, about her brother and about the situation. This is Beth uh, Welford, Beth, uh, his younger sister. Robert and Barbara were the elder pair, near in age. Ben was the youngest, then Beth, four years older. Before Beth and I talked, we were discussing the family photographs in Eric Walter White's biography. There's a marvellous picture in that book when he's raising his hat at the gate. And this was a great family joke because he had, having very bushy hair, he never wore a hat. But when he went to prep school, he had to wear a hat. So everybody said he was have his hair cut. Not that it was ever very long and wear a hat. He was, and he was practicing raising his hat. He went off to school. <laughs> At school, in the old days, they wore bowler hats in the winter and straw hats in the summer. And of course, the bowler hat looked too ridiculous, sitting on top of his extremely curly hair. He was a very lively child, tremendously athletic always, and always had a ball in his hand, either throwing it or hitting it. He was always thin, I suppose, and rather temperamental, nervous. I was going to ask about that because his music and himself, although there are, there are stretches of great calm, one always feels that this nervous tension is, is yes. there. Oh, yes. It's break very much out there. any moment. And this, this was so very much what was it when he was a child? Mm. Yes, of course. Nervy, so. restless? Always very nervy, yes. And never a very good sleeper. What about music? My mother was very musical and she used to play and sing. In fact, she, if she hadn't married, she might have been a professional singer. And she was also a very good pianist. And they always played duets on Sunday afternoons. And he was a Wagner fan, that was. Wagner, they played? Wagner, yes. Meister singers and Siegfried Ido. And it was very strange, because at night, she used to often play the piano. And my elder brother was very musical, and he was seven years older. They used to play, but they had to give it up, because once Ben was asleep, he used to get so upset if he heard any music in the house at all. So they just had to give it up. It upset him, he cried. He didn't want to join in, he just couldn't bear it. Do you remember any music that particularly fascinated him? Well, he had him? phases, you see. I mean, there was a great Beethoven phase, there was a great Brahms phase, and there was a Wagner phase. And the Brahms, we had the pictures of Brahms and statues of Brahms all over the house. This was all while he was in his teens, mostly. Yes. I think the Brahms came the last. He lived the lives of the great artists. He used to go to bed with a piece of paper by his side and a pencil in case he had a thought and get up and write it in the middle of the night. Whether he ever did or not, we didn't know. Mm. When did he start composing then? When he was about five. He started composing pretty well before he could read and write. He started making notes on paper. And he had a very good music teacher. He was fortunate in that way. Beth told me, but she didn't want to say it on the tape, that when he was a, a baby, well, I mean, just, just a, a two or three, he had a very serious illness with a lot of fever. And this uh, fever worried the doctors so much that they told Ben's parents, this child must be kept in cotton wool as an invalid. You mustn't let him play cricket or football or anything like that, because this heart trouble may, may develop that he's got. And it didn't fortunately develop until he was well on. And fortunately, the parents decided that the child must have a, a normal childhood. He must take his chance on illness. And so they let him play cricket, which he loved playing. Uh, I don't think he played football, but he loved cricket and later developed a, a taste for tennis. Uh, and as she says, he loved, loved to win. Um, the mother. Peter Pears, in his younger days, pre-1939, pre pre before he went to America with Ben, uh, he sang in the BBC Singers. 
And there is a recording, which I played to Peter once in an interview for the BBC, and Peter didn't recognize the voice. And I don't think you would recognize the voice, because it's the voice of a, a choir tenor, uh, very English, very straight, um, and not a great deal of individuality. Very musical, of course. And this changed when he went to America, and people who heard the new voice of Peter Pears, which we all know from the records and so on, um, they said it was very like his mother's voice, his mother's singing voice. And it's very, very rather curious. Um, in 1939, Ben was 26, and he was rather, uh, as young people are, rather more interested in politics, perhaps, and setting the world to rights than, than now. Uh, and he very willingly uh, said to his friend Alan Bush, another composer who was a devoted communist, uh, Ben took part and wrote a piece for a ballad, uh, for a festival for the people in 1939. And this uh, was very politically tinged. And so is this work, which is the Ballad of Heroes, which uh, some of you n may know, but I don't think enough people do know. It's a very interesting piece, and it looks forward in some ways, and as you'll hear, uh, to the war requiem. Some of those fanfare noises stayed with him, and some of the, the dance of death kind of, of quality uh, is apparent, as it is in the Symphonia del Requiem. Here is uh, two, two little bits from Ballad of Heroes. First of all, fanfares galore, uh, very like the ballad, but very like the war requiem. And then a setting of Britain, uh, of Auden's poem. Uh, it starts, uh, it's goodbye to the drawing room cry. Uh, it's, it's one of those catalogish. Uh, sort of Leporello uh, cataloguish uh, pieces by, by Auden. And uh, so here are the, first of all, the fanfares, and then the, the beginning of the Dance of Death, which the choir sings.
Very much young man's music, isn't it? Um, not uh, avoiding some influences, that high-lying violin line might almost come from Shostakovich. And some of the chords, he had a passion for Mahler and Mahler chords. Uh, and one set, one interval, uh, one chord never, never quite left him, which consists of an augmented fifth, an augmented fourth, I mean, with a perfect fourth above it. So you get that chord. It comes again and again. One thing he hadn't learned yet by this time was uh, how to present choral lines without them being drowned by the orchestra. Uh, that, but that, that was a gift he discovered a little bit later. But he did love that, that interval, and that interval is also heard sometimes in the Diversions, that, which was one of the first works that he wrote in America. Uh, it's Diversions for the left hand, a pian piano with a left hand only, uh, and orchestra. And this was written on commission from Paul Wittgenstein, who was the man who commissioned Ravel's <coughs> concerto for the left hand and other works. One, uh, some by Schmidt. Uh, he, he also commissioned one from Hindemit and one from Prokofiev. But he was a very difficult person, Paul Wittgenstein. Uh, he came from a difficult family uh, and they, they had their own difficulties. You know that three of the Wittgenstein brothers committed suicide. I mean, a dreadful thing to happen to any family, God. Um, anyhow, Wittgenstein was a bossy, uh, aggressive sort of person, and he tried actually to uh, get Ravel to change some of his scoring because he said he couldn't, the piano couldn't be heard enough. The one piece that he liked uh, that was commissioned for him was these diversions, and he played them many times in America. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a piece with great charm and I'd like to play you three little bits of it, including a march with a wonderful dum da da dum dum da da dum rhythm, which once you've heard, you won't rem forget. Here we go.
curious, Britain had an, seemed to have an obsession with the key of D. The piano concerto, the violin concerto, Symphonia de Requiem, and this piece uh, all hover around the key of D. Um, Britain once said to me, he said, why does everybody make such a fuss about C major? He said, because I think D major is a much better key. It's better for the, for the string players, bit better for lots of uh, uh, the uh, voices, and it suits much better. So, of course, he did write music in C major as well, but uh, this, is, this is part of the D. And one of the works that it really is seeped in D is the Symphonia da Requiem. I won't play much of it, I'll just play you t t 15 seconds, just to remind you of that wonderful, deep, toned opening, really uh, a sound of doom. Wonderful noise. And here uh, I'm going to play you a bit of the Scottish, Scottish ballad, which he wrote for the two piano team, Ethel Bartlett and Ray Robertson. He wrote one or two pieces for them. Uh, they were both in love with him. Ethel Bartlett, incidentally, was Jervis de Pyre's uh, aunt, I think. Um, this uh, was a work that was given its first performance, and I remember the first performance in the Albert Hall. And after it, I decided to walk up to Notting Hill Gate, and I fell in with Frank Howes, who was music critic of the Times at that time. And I could see that Frank was in a very bad mood. He glowered. And after about a few minutes, he turned to me and said very angrily, Amos, tell me, this fellow Britain, is he serious or not? <laughs> not that the Scots Ballad is a very skittish piece, but obviously Frank Howes was, thought it was. It was curious, at that time, there were uh, quite a lot of elderly critics. Frank Howes was one, Richard Capel of The Telegraph was another, and they were fairly, fairly powerful, Ernest Newman. And uh, they were like Canutes. They were trying to stem the tide of contemporary music. And the BBC boss at that time, uh, composer Johnston, uh, he was also, uh, they were very much against Ben and they tried not to include his works whenever possible. Here is a bit of the Scots ballad uh, and you'll see that it's, it's not very difficult music and it's very Scottish and a bit skittish sometimes but it's based on wonderful tunes.
At that time, he wrote an overture for Cleveland Orchestra and completely forgot about it. When Cleveland wrote to him years later and said, look, they discovered this score of an overture he'd written, he wrote back and said, I didn't write an overture for Cleveland. What are you talking about? <laughs> so they finally sent him this, a copy of the score, and he recognized it. Of course, that it was in his, his, his handwriting, and it's a very Britannish piece, a little bit mixed with his admiration and friendship and influence from and with Aaron Copeland, who was a good friend of his at that time. Uh, they lived in various places. They had a good time and a bad time. They went to Canada, which was where they met Bartlett and Robertson. And uh, they also shared a flat in, in, um, in New York with some rather bohemian people, and Ben hated that. Ben was always on the side of, of convention in some ways and particularly in food, and, and these bohemian boys and girls uh, did not agree with him. Carson McCullers, for example. Uh, it's strange to think of Carson McCullers and Benjamin Britten sharing an evening meal. <laughs> uh, Peter Pears, the, the, uh, the love affair was, uh, as you might say, con con consummated at this time in America, uh, and Peter's uh, voice when he came back to England was a great success. Um, the punch had, a, had a, a piece of poetry about him. He said, there's no need for peers to give himself airs. He has them written by Benjamin Britten. <laughs> when you think uh, of the amount of music that uh, Britain wrote for peers. It's quite extraordinary. There's been nothing like it in, in, the, in the history of music. A dozen operas, uh, song cycles with and without orchestra or with piano. Um, everything seemed to, to uh, be geared to Peter's voice, which some people hated. And some people imitated, like Dudley Moore, uh, as you may remember. <coughs> It was an easy voice to imitate it. I once imitated it uh, at the request of Joan Cross in, in Liverpool after a performance of, of some tippet. Um, and Ben was there and Peter was there and Joan Cross kept on saying, do your imitation of Ben, of, of Peter. And I said, no, 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 it'll upset him. <laughs> I did, finally, and it did. Ben didn't speak to me for quite a year, I think. <laughs> that was the thing. Ben was very easy to get on with, but if you said the wrong thing, uh, if you made a, a dirty joke, he didn't like dirty jokes, uh, and he didn't like any reference to composers that he loved being made fun of. He couldn't stand that. Um, and he couldn't stand being made fun of himself. He, he was conducting the LSO once uh, and at a rehearsal, and the two of the double basses had nothing to play for umpteen bars, and they were reading the paper and laughing at a, at a cartoon in, in the Daily Express. And Ben thought they were laughing at him, and he walked off angrily and wouldn't speak, to, wouldn't uh, conduct the orchestra for at least two years after that. He was very, very easy to, to upset um, and prone to taking offense at criticism. On the journey back from America, uh, he'd been suffering a bit of a blockage, but the, the thought that they were coming back to England, uh, even though it was a rotten voyage which took from America, it took them five weeks, can you imagine, to get from America to England. They had to go up and down the coast avoiding um, German uh, opposition. But on the journey, he, 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 he wrote uh, a marvelous hymn to St. Cecilia and also the ceremony of carols. He loved boys' voices, especially, uh, apparently, the, the more raw uh, sound of the Catholic boys uh, in choirs, such as there were, uh, rather than the Anglican uh, typical choir boy, a little bit, rather a sugary sound. So he wrote this ceremony of carols for boys' voices and harp. And 
he spilled out at that time wonderful tunes, including this one, which is the sort of bulalo uh, noise, sung by a solo and then the choir. As you know, he had this extraordinary knack of writing music that felt contemporary, but also was immediately attractive to the ear and to the mind. Wonderful gift. When they got back to England, they were much fated uh, by, I think, about half the, the population and uh, derided by the other half because they, everybody thought that they'd done a bunk and gone to a, when, when they went to America. Uh, as soon as the war started. But in fact, they went to America six months before the war did start. But the people who loved him, uh, he be Piers from Britain recitals, became the, the hottest ticket in London. That and perhaps the uh, Sadler's World Ballet at that time. Uh, they also made new friends. One in particular was Michael Tippett, whose music was coming to the fore at that time. Um, they got on terribly well. They both loved Dow and Dunstable and Purcell in particular. Uh, and this was a, a bond between them. Uh, I, I don't think Ben always liked Tippett's music because there is a, a quality in Tippett which is slightly unprofessional. Uh, he, he, he never quite knew when he started a work what was going to happen before it got to the end. Uh, his music, I think, sometimes sometimes goes deeper than anything Britain wrote, but it, it is also much more difficult to perform. <coughs> uh, when uh, Ben was 50, I think it was, Tippett wrote a very nice letter uh, to him. And when Tippett became 60, uh, Ben published and I recorded uh, Britain actually speaking a letter which he wrote to Tippett, and here it is. My dear Michael, now it is your turn. Just having had myself one of these memorial years, I know what you are in for. I'm sure you'll be touched by the tributes, but I hope you won't be too embarrassed by all the evaluations. You must not be made to feel, as I was, that you are already dead, and that the musicologists are busy on the corpse. We both have a lot more notes to write yet. Evaluations, comparisons, the whole apparatus. Does it mean anything to you? It doesn't to me much. Slaps or bouquets, they come too late to help or to change, long after the work is done. What matters to us now is that people want to use our music. For that, as I see it, is our job be useful and to the living. Criticism likes to separate, to dislodge, to imply rivalries, to provoke jealousies. But I don't think I am jealous. Envious, yes, possibly of the man who can do something much better than I can. And the colleagues whom I admire, I regard as friends on the sides of the angels rather than as rivals. Do you remember the story of Haydn banging the table, rushing from the room when someone poked fun at Don Giovanni? He knew very well the problems of finding the right notes and balancing forms. Schumann, too, 
who later found such difficulty in getting the courage to write at all, was the tenderest of critics. What does it matter if some of the people he admired mean little to us? His first duty was to his contemporaries, not to us. No one could have expressed the agony of composition more sympathetically than yourself, Michael, when you wrote about me. For you are a composer, living in the same environment, facing the same problems as myself. This is the natural soil for friendship, and friendship is stimulating and creative and unifying. We have known each other now for more than 20 years. We have been very close, often, and at other times we have seemed to be moving in different directions. But whenever I see our names bracketed together, and they often are, I am glad to say, I am reminded of the spirit of courage and integrity, sympathy, gaiety, and profound musical independence, which is yours. And I am proud to call you my friend. Your devoted, Ben. P.S. I wish your piano parts weren't so difficult. I first met uh, Britain and Pears through Michael Tippett, because at that time Tippett was music director of Morley College and put on little house concerts every, time, every now and then, and he asked Peter to sing at one of them, which he did, and Britain came along after to collect Peter after the concert, and we all met, and Britain was very nice to me, so was Peter. Uh, and uh, when Michael was put into jug, because he was a conscientious objector, uh, I managed to, through the Quaker visitor, John Fisher, uh, to arrange for a recital by Peter and Ben in the Wormwood Scrubs. Uh, and I got in as page turner. <laughs> and I remember we went on a number eight bus to the Scrubs and got in and uh, we managed to inveigle the person who was in charge of the, of, at that particular weekend. The governor had gone home uh, and the chaplain was in charge. And we said, uh, the music is so difficult for the turning over uh, that we need a second person to help. <laughs> uh, the chaplain, of course, didn't know enough about music to know we were talking rubbish. Um, and he said, but I can't do that because a prisoner is not allowed to go up on the platform uh, because he might start addressing his, his fellow convicts. Um, and I said to Ben, work your charm. And he did, and they put out two chairs, and Michael Tippett and I, uh, oh, by the way, when, they, when he said, how am I going to find somebody who can read music? I said, prisoner 4583. <laughs> And so Michael came on the platform and we turned pages alternately. <laughs> Which reminds me of a charming story uh, that I heard from Larry Adler. He gave a recital in Wormwood Scrubs and the, the governor was there on that occasion and said, please, Mr. Adler, don't mention anything about prison or freedom or convicts, anything like that. And Larry Adler thought that was probably wrong. And at the end of his recital, he played three encores and said, I can't play any more because I've got another date. He said, but I'll tell you what, next week I'm giving a concert in the Wigmore Hall. If you're free, why don't you come? <laughs> got a tremendous cheer. <laughs> Britain at that time, well, and, and, it, and forever, was an uh, utterly charming person. And because I knew of, of, of his music and worshipped the music, um, I worshipped him too. I thought he was marvellous. He was really wonderful to be with. He had a terrific charisma. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that. And he, uh, I was uh, courting at that time a violinist who, wa who had a string quartet, Olive Zorian, um, and she and her girls uh, did the first performance of Britain's second string quartet. Uh, it was for a, a sort of mini festival of the Wigmore uh, in, uh, on the 250th anniversary of Britain's, of uh, Purcell's death or birth or something. Um, and Ben wrote this marvelous quartet for that time, uh, which ends with a, a magnificent chacon in, in uh, 
as it were, a great tribute to, to Purcell. And uh, they rehearsed that quartet in, in our flat. Uh, and uh, because I think the quartet, we only had four chairs, I think. So Britton and I, at the rehearsal, sat on the floor, and the score was between us, and we looked at it together. I was then 23. Uh, green and uh, rather silly, I suppose. Never mind. Uh, and uh, it was interesting because I would say to Ben, oh, that's interesting, that bit there, um, the, the first theme comes back upside down. And Britain said, no, really? I can't believe it. And we'd have a good look and say, by God, you're right. <laughs> and I was never quite sure at that time whether he was taking the mickey out of me or not. <laughs> I have a feeling he probably was. But, you know, composers, when they're engrossed in creation, they don't, they, they sometimes, the, the themes and everything are in their head and they write and they don't always know exactly whether something comes upside down or inside out or tries to speed. Fascinating. Anyhow, I'd like to play you a bit of the quartet, the whole of the scherzo, which lasts about three and a half minutes. The first movement is utterly calm and the last movement is this big, long chacon ending in a most tumultuous C major. Uh, wonderfully scored for the, for the quartet. But the middle movement is very unquiet. It's very disturbed, and it rushes about. And in fact, it, it is monothematic, I think. The second tune, which comes in octaves on the violin, um, is, is, a, is, is, an, is another version of the, of the rushing, rushing music which you hear at the beginning. Incidentally, uh, when Britain heard from Olive that she was going to marry me, he said, but you can't marry somebody who doesn't really appreciate Mozart, <laughs> which I didn't at that time. Uh, but somehow he allowed us to get married. <laughs> Here is the quartet scherzo, rushing, and this middle section with the wonderful octave passages for the first violin. Thank you. 
when Michael went to prison, I, uh, at that time, had been a sort of secretary uh, gopher, uh, because I lived in London and Tippett lived down in Surrey. And uh, when, when he got it shoved into jug, Britain thought per perhaps I would, I would be lonely, uh, and it was very sweet of him, although he knew I wasn't Tippett's lover, I never was any, any man's lover. Um, and uh, he asked me to dinner, and we had dinner à deux a couple of times, and it was very, very nice. And I was also present at a rather historic moment. Uh, he had a room at that time in a, over a co-op uh, shop in St. John's Wood. It was the flat of Erwin Stein and his family, who was um, from Vienna, and uh, he was Britain's minder, so to speak, at Booze in Hawks, his publisher. He saw the works through the press, and he was a great friend and helper and minder of, of Ben Breton. And his daughter was Marion, who duly fell in love with Michael, uh, with um, Ben, and realized that he wasn't any good, and she then married Lord Harwood. She was uh, Lord Harwood. In fact, she comes to the festival. I think she's the only person I know who's been to more festivals than I have. Um, she was here uh, one day last week, uh, but she didn't stay very long. She's not at all well. She's in a, a wheelchair at the moment. Uh, and uh, I was present then at lunch one day, uh, and after lunch, instead of having coffee with us, um, ben went to a little card table at the, in a corner of the room and was busy, busy writing at a, a full score. And then he came back and he said, right, I think I'll have my coffee now. I have just written the last note of the orchestral score of Peter Grimes. <laughs> great, great moment. Um, after the uh, performance of the second string quartet for the first time, um, HMV decided to record it, and it was on the old 78s, and the quartet took seven sides. And they said, now we have to think of something for the, for the eighth side. Uh, and somebody suggested that Britain might play the viola uh, in a performance of the fantasy upon one note, and Purcell, in which the viola, that particular viola, there are two, uh, only plays one note. And Ben thought this was an exciting idea until he came to the recording when he got terribly nervous about this one note. And in fact, just to play one note for three and a half minutes is damn difficult because your bow starts going, uh, 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 uh. Uh, but he got through it. But that is the only recording uh, of Benjamin Britten playing the viola, which he loved doing and played a lot of chamber music, as you know. Um, Aldborough. One of the stalwarts was Imogen Holst, daughter of the famous composer Gustav. Um, not, actually BBC Three uh, was heard recently to talk about Gustav and his wife Imogen, <laughs> which was pretty unlikely. Imogen was a wonderful person. She had, during the war, done wonderful talks all over the country for SEMA in places where they had no music, and then the government was worried that the ladies were getting fed up with the war and needed some entertainment. So she went round singing rounds and things like that. She was a marvelous lecturer, too, and one of the best lecturers I've ever heard. Uh, she, she was so wonderfully prepared. She was prepared for everything in life. Um, she was a strange person. William Brock once said he couldn't quite decide whether Imogen was 51% sincere, 49 play acting, or was it the other way around? <laughs> uh, but she was a wonderful person. She had elements in her of Joyce Grenfell and elements of Margaret Rutherford. She, she wore homespun clothes, sensible shoes, of course, um, and uh, she was great fun as well as being devoted to music. She was, really was the handmaid of music. First of all with Seema, and then she was m music uh, director at Dartington Hall, and uh, then she came 
to Aldborough, and she was director uh, with Ben and Peter. Uh, here she is, and she talks about how she became the amanuensis of Britain and worked with him, and it's very interesting to, to hear how they worked together. Imogen Holtz. So he wrote and asked me if I, knowing that I was going to leave Dartington, asked me if I'd consider coming to Aubra to work for the Aubra Festival. And it was marvellous invitation. And when I got here in September 52, having had my few months abroad, he asked me, as well as working for the Aubra Festival, if I would be his amanuensis. He'd had several, one after another, and as I was going to live in Aubra, it was obviously going to be useful if I could go copying for him and making vocal scores of his operas and preparing his full scores so that he didn't have to waste any time. Well, he began work at 8.30 in the morning. I had a bed sitting room within five minutes walking distance so that I aimed at being there when he was there. And he wanted the full score prepared. And so I could sit in the next room where I didn't disturb him. And he'd give me the sketches and I could plan the pages and at the same time begin the neat copy for the vocal score, which could go to the chorus master and to the publisher, because of course the publisher had to have it published to present the Queen in the following June. And publication, oh dear, that's a slower business than composing, isn't it? Well, we, he'd work till around about 12.30, and he'd then ask me what I'd done, and he'd look at it, criticise anything that he wanted to criticise, and if it were my piano reduction for the vocal score, he'd take it to the piano and play it, and make very helpful suggestions for the pianistic point of view was marvellous. It was like having the best lessons one could ever have had. He always very wisely took a rest from work immediately after his midday meal and he'd go a walk, usually alone, thinking about what he'd written that morning and what he was going to write later on. But sometimes, entirely off work, he'd play tennis with friends, and, of course, in the summer, he'd swim. That was a great thing. And then he'd begin work again round about 4.30 and would go on till about 7. And then he'd stop and have a hot bath and his evening meal. And then he wouldn't work after dinner in the evening unless it was frantically behind and he had to go on with the actual score. That didn't happen in Gloriana. It happened in Prince of the Pagodas later on. An enormous score, <laughs> which really was a great trial. I remember thinking, can I possibly go on at 9.30 at night, having begun at 8.30 in the morning? When it was possible, if Britain and Piers were on a concert tour perhaps, Imogen would get a chance to work with her Purcell singers. 